So I'm waiting on tenter hooks. You're on tenter hooks. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Sarah's here. She's our guest today, and her uh, her profession is a museum director. Yes. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Hello, Sarah. Hello, Welcome. Hello, Joe. Thank you very much. Yeah. You you said thank you quite early. For welcoming me. Oh, thank you good. for welcoming me. Good, yeah. yeah. Just clarifying yeah. that. Let's, Get the let's, niceties. Yeah, Tom done. usually right. fucks it up. No, oh, thanks very much. What museum, Sarah? Uh, the museum is the De Morgan Foundation. So we're a tiny independent charity that owns a collection of Victorian artworks, some of which I brought for you to have a look at oh, today. Hello. What? Hang on. You took stuff out of your museum. <laughs> I did. And you've brought it with? Yes. Well, I think we should start there, shouldn't we, Tom? I think that's a good Let's place to start. Let's do it. So, uh, so it's the De Morgan. Yep. Is that all one word? That's two words. D E M O R G A. -N. Oh, so De Morgan. De Morgan. Oh, okay. Who is De Morgan? De Morgans were a married couple in the Victorian period. So William De Morgan made ceramics, and his wife Evelyn De Morgan was a painter. And more interestingly than that, maybe both of them were big supporters of the suffrage movement. So mm. very fiercely campaigned for women to get the vote, particularly William, who was the vice president of the Men's League for Women's Suffrage in 1913. Mm. There we go. Then. There we that, go. Right, so what have you brought with us today then? With you? What? So what have you brought with you today? For you. For us. It. Well, it's not to keep. Oh, do we need to wear white gloves? You don't for these objects. So these are from our handling collection. Joe, so I I'm regularly take these out of the museum. I'm going to pass schools. you one, Joe. You describe your one, I'll describe my one. For arm. example. Um, this looks, Sarah, like, well, it's a tile, it's a glazed tile. Correct. With a vine and an unspecified to me purple flower. Um, it's got a nice heft to it. It looks slightly like the sort of thing my gran used to have around her fireplace. Joe? What the fuck sort of fireplace did your gran have? Well, one with nice glazed tiles around it. Fucking, you're from money, aren't you? <laughs> Christ, I've got a, um, I've got a tile. Uh, mine's broken, and I may add that it was broke <laughs> when it was handed to me. Um, but it's intact. It's got a, I'm going to say it's a lion, but I don't think that is a lion. It looks like a, like a, a liger. I think it's a, a lion. Yeah. The, uh, with a married tiger, a tiger. Married a tiger. And then the bottom one looks like quite an angry uh, puma. <laughs> but it's actually red. So the liger is gold and the puma is red. And again, I would say that this is um, probably 17th century um, and formed part of the hieroglyphics <laughs> of uh, the Delaware Museum. True or false, Sarah? False. Oh. oh. But what I always like to say about museums and the collections that you see in them when you go to them is it's not a place for facts. It's a place for stories. Oh. And you're only ever going to get one side of the story, the person telling it and how you interpret that. So if that's your interpretation, Joe, then that's... That's absolutely fine. That's a good thing to have when you're interpreting Absolutely art. fine, but incredibly incorrect. Yes. Oh, right. So <laughs> can A you... summary for your life, eh, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. So what are these then? So you're looking at two tiles uh, made by William de Morgan, obviously, because that's oh. the museum I've come from today. Yeah. Um, and the one that, so they've swapped. So now Tom has the one with the, we call them lions, but I loved the story. Uh, and Joe's got the floral one. So William de Morgan believed that really by making things by hand and decorating them and putting some beauty into people's homes, he could maybe do his little bit in making Victorian Britain a little bit more beautiful. So whilst everything was being industrialized and put through factories and the systems were coming in so that everything was machine made, actually to have something handmade that was beautiful in your home might inspire something in you beyond I like the cut of this man's jib. around it. Mr. De Morgan. So it's wonderful. We're going to put, Joe, by the way, um, we're going to put pictures of this on our socials, aren't we, so people can see the tiles that we're referring to. Are we? I hope so, yeah. That well, looks so scared. It's not a bad thing. Well, how are you putting them on there, then? We're just going to post them. I wouldn't trust real mail, mate. <laughs> not at the minute. Um, Sarah, I'd like to ask a question. Is there um, much um, danger that if Joe and I were to break either of these, we'd have to go to jail? Yeah, definitely. Are they valuable? Um, they are. 
<gasps> I'm going to give them back to you before I ask the obvious follow-up question. Having released the tiles, how much are those tiles worth, Sarah? So those are objects from our handling collection, like I just mentioned. So we take these out to people who can't physically get to our museum sites so that we're making sure we can be as accessible as possible. So I take them to primary schools a lot, which is why I thought we might just be OK today. Ah, um, <laughs> no? I see. <laughs> I see what we're doing. We're going with a passive aggressive approach. I, I quite like it. Good. Yeah. Um, so these tiles from yeah, like our handling collection. So I actually bought these two off eBay for the collection for about hundred pounds each. So you can get De Morgan tiles quite oh, cheaply. Oh, okay. Um, lots of other artworks in lots of other museums, as you can imagine, have a much higher financial value than that. But it's not really something that we talk about in the cultural sector, given that the cultural and historic value of objects is so much more than the financial one. What is a museum? A fantastic question. I think at its very heart and very sort of the easy answer to that question is a museum is an institution or a place that holds collections for the public benefit. So that's the party line. But there are museums across the country and the world that interpret that and work within that in very, very different ways. Um, so the obvious example, I think, is maybe the British Museum, the great big one in central London that every, lots of you know, millions of people a year go to see artifacts and objects from all over the world in it. Um, and then you've got the museum that I work on, so the De Morgan Foundation. Like I said, we're tiny. We've got a museum space in Barnsley in Yorkshire um, and the collection pieces that I brought you today that we take out and about on the road. And um, there's only one member of staff, so there's only me at, uh, at my museum. So they can be quite different institutions, but really we hold, we look after stuff so that people can see it. That's the, that's the, uh, Do you like a museum, Joe? Are you a museum visitor? I, 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 visit, I visited some. I visited that one, um, with the, uh, it's got those mirrors in it that make, that change your body. Not a circus? No. I'm sure, no, because this was the same museum that had that big dinosaur in it. And the big sperm whale, the big blue whale. What's the big whale? Natural History Museum. The Natural History Museum. Yeah, been to that Very one. Because um, it's got Andy's clock in it. From Andy's Dinosaur Adventures. Andy's Dinosaur mm. Adventures. That's one of my f favourite places to go to. I've been to the one, the science one. Yeah. That was fascinating. I like that one because you get to actually do mm. shit. You did. There, all the experiments. And then um, we went to the condom museum yeah uh, the condomarium in amsterdam mm -hmm. that was a particular highlight of for me and i've also been to rajar kipling's house hmm. bateman's what's bateman's rajar kipling's house <laughs> it's called bateman's it's in, it's in burwash i used to work in the tea room but you know on my break i'd walk around the house just to get more culture well, I'll see what I could pilfer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? He's got his car there. It was wonderful. You know, I like a museum. But is, is the purpose of a museum to teach this generation and future generations the history of the last generation and what's come before them? Is that the purpose of it? or? So the purpose of a museum, yeah, is to absolutely collect objects from the past and tell stories about those objects. And I think it's always really important when you're visiting a museum to think whose story are you being told? So who's the director? Who are the curators? What's their story? What are they bringing to that object? And who are they telling it to? So what kind of people can you see around you and who is that story for? I think there's been a shift quite recently in the purpose of a museum in whether that's about telling stories of the past or like you said, Joe, to look a bit more forward and to see what we should be collecting now, what's important to people of our generation, so that we can go to the museum and make sure that we are shaping our own identity and learning our place in the world based on looking at objects from other cultures, other countries, or even from other people in our local area, in order that we can maybe think a little bit more about the future. The, the, cynic the cynicism issues that I have mm -hmm. about museums, particularly the big ones around the world, is that I'm sure loads of the stuff's been fucking pillaged and stolen from loads of different cultures, put into these museums, and then the stories that are said about them 
are just from one side and it's it's the successor's story you know that, that gets to dictate this is what this giant stone is actually it's a fucking stolen artifact from this culture but we've decided to so that's the cynic in me that goes mm, i'm not sure i'm buying any of this shit in the museums I think that's a really good place to start. So a fabulous example of that is the Parthenon Frieze in the British Museum. So if you go in through the main entrance and turn left, you'll get to a great big hallway that's got all these ancient Greek sculptures in it that were taken in the early um, 1800s from Greece and brought to London. Um, the circumstances that surrounded that are a bit dodgy, um, so they, as you, as you would imagine. Uh, so the seventh Earl of Elgin actually bought them and he claims that he was given an official decree by the Ottomans who actually owned Greece at the time to take this stuff back to London. Fishy. It's so, uh, officially, it's never been found, hasten to add. Mm. And then well, after he bought them back to Britain, they were sold to the British Museum in 1816. So they officially entered the British Museum's collection. In 1832, Greece became an independent state. And since 1832, they've been asking for them back. And the reason that they're not back is that there is a piece of legislation in this country which affects the National Museum. So the big ones, Joe's mentioned the Natural History Museum. We're talking about the British Museum, which prevents them getting taking anything out of the collection. So that's an that's that's the law so that's it's a tricky issue and it'd be interesting to know what you both think about where in the world these ancient greek sculptures should be i'm wondering joe because of britain's colonial past we must have pilfered more than we've been pilfered does that make sense 100 percent. we fucking nicked everything mate mm. i mean it's hard because i'm incredibly uninformed on <laughs> <laughs> on most of the subjects that we we cover but we like invaded all these lands we nicked everything and colonized is that the word mm -hmm. colonized their lands yes we gave things you know like reading <laughs> <laughs> writing probably not <laughs> Did we give anything? We, we gave some things. We gave some things. Gave okay, some we things. gave some things. Not sure what they are by the sounds of it. But we took most things. And we went, that's ours now. And that's part of our culture. We're going to take that. We're going to we're going to dictate the story we tell on this item. And we say, you know, it was a great war that we did. And this was at the end of it. And you're like, well, no, it wasn't a great war. You just murdered a load of people and then nicked their shit. And then you went, oh, I'm going to put it in a museum. And I'm going to charge it extortionate amounts of money to the public to come in and fucking look at them and tell them some bullshit story. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite a lot for us to unpick there, Sarah. Um, <laughs> so sorry. In no way, I'm just getting that side of me and the museums out early doors and then hopefully flipping it round. What, Sarah, would be, because I think we're probably all sympathetic with the, certainly the core of what Joe is trying to say there, but what would be the counter argument to that? Would it be, for example, that... Um, Joe and I would not be aware of any of these artifacts if we weren't, and the cultures they came from, if we weren't first exposed to them in a museum here. I think it's really important to remember how these artifacts have ended up in the museum. And that's what I was sort of saying at the start, and what Joe's picked up on is museums are telling stories. So when you go in and you look at these Parthenon friezes again, for example, there'll be a little object label next to them. And quite often this will focus on how they were made, the beauty of them, what's special about them and the date and the size. Well, that doesn't tell you how they've ended up in that collection. And from my personal practice, I just think that's so incredibly important because if something's been bought in good faith from the country of origin and brought to display in a museum in this country so that we can learn about other cultures, is that a different argument then for having it than whether it has been taken in horrendous circumstances by force and ended up here because it's been stolen? So I think we need to remember that there are different ways things enter the museums and, you know, not everything has, has come there under these sort of questionable circumstances. So I'm going to give you um, a little list of some of the more unusual museums in the world. And I would like you to say um, whether you are keen to visit, mm -hmm. should opportunity arise or not. Mm. Uh, number one, the Instant Noodle Museum in Japan. Ramen Museum. Do you go to it? Nope. Would you? No. Number what the two. fuck are you going there for? Like, there's just a hundred different packs of ramen 
from the last 50 years with um his name was chris no who the guy invented the instant ramen oh it sounds to me like his you're writing chris. the target matter his name is chris <laughs> Sounds unlikely for a noodle maker, doesn't it? it hey, like you're right. No, target market. See, that's what I mean. The, yeah. the story that's being told story. is confusing. Is. So you don't want to go. Uh, do I get ramen in the canteen afterwards? Yes, Lock but it. it's instant. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll give it a go. Number two, the Tap Water Museum in Beijing. Sounds like the most fucking pointless thing in the whole entire world. Bear in mind, tap water in Beijing isn't even safe to drink. <laughs> True. Okay, so that's the good. irony. Here we go. Let's have a fucking museum about what we can't drink. Go on. Okay, that's number two. Number three, the Dog Collar Museum at Leeds Castle in Kent. Absurd. Sounds like one of the most boring places in the world. We've got 130 dog collars. 130? 130? 130 different dog collars from down Sorry, years. did you say that in a way that I was meant to be impressed? Okay, that's There's 130. Di there can't be 130 different dog collars, mate. It goes round. And re they're all round. Again, this sounds like a very persuasive argument for you to go to the Dog Collar Museum. Joe, I'll give you a fourth. Uh, the Lawnmower Museum in Southport. I actually might consider that. I'm having trouble with my lawnmower at the minute. Um, the blades aren't going. So I'd like to know where lawnmowers originally came from so I can work out how we can go forward with them. I'm going to give you a couple more, Joe. Well, oh, uh, hang on. Why can't I give you some? You can. All right. <laughs> you fancy going to the Avanos Hair Museum in Turkey? Tell me more. There's over 16,000 types of hair. What? Specifically from women. What? And they're like draped on the walls and shit. What? Yeah, you know, like, so if you walked in... So you like whole heads of hair or just single hairs? What? Whole heads of hair, like, like wigs or single hairs? No, no, they're hairs. What do you mean whole heads of hair? No, no, it's hair that's been cut off and then stuck to the wall. <laughs> yeah, but how much hair is in each display? I've just said 16,000 different types of women. <laughs> Specifically, am it I sounds looking, a bit creepy, if I'm honest. Am I looking at a solitary strand of hair from each of these many women? No, there's 16,000. I know how many women, but how many, like, am I, am I going to be blown away by seeing loads of lustrous No, you locks? won't be blown away at all. They won't put fucking fans anywhere near that place. <laughs> It'll blow all the hair away. Um... What about the Celebrity Lingerie Hall of Fame in the United States of America? Okay, tell me more. You've got Tom Hanks' gump pants there. His gump pants? Yeah, from Forrest Gump, mm -hmm. the pants that he wore there. Um, <laughs> you could go and have a look at the entire cast of Belly, Bev Beverly Hills 90210, which I've never, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but they've put all their underwear in there. In there yeah. And you can also go and have a look at Madonna's purple and gold bra. Ooh. But that's not the original. Um because a few years back, it was actually looted. In the, uh, there was LA riots, was there? <laughs> they nicked the Madonna's bra. What, what year was the LA riots? 92? 92. 92. So in 92, uh, that bra was nicked. And then um, Madonna said, if you pay 10 grand to charity, I'll give you a new one. I'll knock out another set. And they did. Would you go there? Yes. Sarah, would you go there? Yeah, why not? Oh, okay, no, fine. Um, and then, what about the Museum of Death? Oh, heard of this? that one? I haven't heard of that one, but I, again, I'd be keen to visit. Really? Them. The Museum of Death? It's got all the worst ways to die, like, Ugh. depicted in bodies and shit. Actual like, people who've died that way? Yeah, like, chopped up limbs, bullet wounds in the skulls, and um, it's <laughs> it actually said, be sure not to miss the mummified body of Sioi. Sayui. Sayui? Who, who is this person? Well, his first name's Sai and his second name's Oi. Simon. No, <laughs> no, he's definitely not a Simon. Um, he was a cannibal who murdered loads of kids during the 1950s. Hmm. Still want to go there? It's quite gory, isn't it? I'd say so. Yeah. And then, last but not least, probably my favourite, what about the Phallological Museum in Iceland? The Phallological what? The Phallological Museum in what, Iceland. What would we find there? 206... 267 types of penis. <laughs> I'm sorry? You would find 267 types of different penis. Actual penises or plaster cast? No, actual penis. There's loads of plaster cast stuff there, but there's actual, it's actual mum, um, uh, vinegared. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what do they put stuff in the, what do they put stuff in? Uh, formaldehyde. Brine. 
formaldehyde. Right. Great. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, so you know the stuff you get your tuna in. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. That's sometimes you, sunflower oil or spring water. Spring water, but this one's brine, cheaper. Um, so you can go see loads of penises and brine included <laughs> a two millimetre hamster dick. <laughs> <laughs> no word of a lie. This, Is that big or small for a hamster? Uh, well, you find out when you get there. I didn't delve that. Like, <laughs> I didn't really want my Google history. <laughs> Three hamster dicks. Fucking like hamster dicks left, right and centre. Mm. Or a 1.7 metre sperm whale dick. 1.7 metres? Massive. That's you. Stand up. Oh, I thought, sorry, you mean my height. <laughs> stand up. thought you were paying me an amazing compliment stand there. Up. You said that's you. Please, can you stand up? That's how big it is. Dick. <laughs> what are you standing up for? <laughs> um, any of those strike you, just take your fancy. The thing is, Sarah, listen to that list. Is there anything that couldn't be a museum? I don't know how to answer that in the double negative, but anything could be a museum. It's a very poor question, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't work it out. Yeah, anything can be in a museum. Of course it can. How do we define a museum then? What's a museum? What's just a collection of random things? Well, I would think in the definition I gave you at the start, the really important bit of that is it's got to be for the public benefit. So you've really got to think of who's going to want to come to see it. So you could just have a museum at home with loads of random shit in it if you wanted. <laughs> but it maybe then wouldn't fulfil the second part of that criteria of being in the public benefit. So people who want to come to see it, that you've got stories to tell, engaging things. But, I mean, you might do with your stuff from home. So that would be fine too. What are the other weird ones that you're familiar with? Any other strange ones that Joe hasn't got on his list then? Surely we've covered all of them. Well... I'm pleased you brought up the penis museum in Iceland because I, d I didn't actually call it a penis museum. You didn't. I called it a phallological museum. I beg your pardon. The museum of phallology, <laughs> and I didn't actually know that that was a thing. But I'm so happy it is. Phallology. Yeah, phallology. Yeah, we're all learning something. Yeah. Um, so as a reaction to that, in 2017, um, a vagina museum was actually set up in London. Oh. Huh. So there you go. Whereabouts in London? <laughs> it's currently in Bethnal Green in temporary uh, premises, but they're hoping to find somewhere permanent. Why not? That is so, so fucking. There should be. There should be. Um, there should be. There should be a museum of vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> is there a, a, a follow up point? Or there should, should be. A, a museum of whatever the fuck you want there to be. Well, do you know, Joe? <laughs> because I've been to a museum in Hobart in Tasmania. Oh, yeah. One of my favourite holiday destinations. Called MoMA. And there is something um, there which is called the Great Wall of Vaginas. And it's 151 plaster casts of actual vaginas. He's having a think about that one. Um, it's also are they all different? Well, I think they're re I think they're real vaginas that have had plaster casts made of them. So I'd say yes. So it, there's a did you say it's a climbing wall? Is it? Yeah, it's a climbing wall. Well, and they have different coloured vaginas for different. Roots up the wall, like a blue easy route. No, it's not a climbing wall. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's that's why there was a pause for me when you said it. I went, fucking hell, like, how have they angled that? I wonder if there's different ways to climb it. Like, <laughs> I know. Do you know? So that's why I was like, I'm not sure how far we want to go down this route. Because <laughs> I, I know that in the phallological uh, museum, there is a wall of uh, penises, plaster cast penises as well. And you can climb that. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you mean you can, in theory, climb it because you could get a good grip or you're actively encouraged to climb it? No, it's, it's available to climb. But like clipping harnesses and stuff. It's not that fucking high. <laughs> Wait, so, how many penises? Get up that 2.7 sperm whale one. There you well, go. Yeah. That'd be quite high, wouldn't it? That's a yeah, good but, start. Pff, fucking hell, you're gonna have, you've got a job on your hands climbing that. Could you, do you think you get a grip on the hamster one? I don't think they use that. I don't think. <laughs> I just, I think you're out of order. It's called, Joe, the Great Wall of Vaginas. It does have a, another name, which is so rude, I'm simply going to pass you my piece of paper. That's the official name for the artwork. Fuck off. No, it is. It's disgusting. I would never use language like that. 
Okay. Do you want me to read these next bits? I can't read your writing. <laughs> Secret. Well, these are a couple of favourite uh, museums of mine, Sarah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we're in Kennington today in, in our Joe Marler Show studio. These are in central London, the John Soane yep. Museum. Tell us a little bit more about that. It's quite a famous secret museum, isn't it? What? Yeah, if you haven't been, <gasps> definitely look it up and go. Um, so, so John Soane was an architect and he made this huge collection of lots of antiquities um, and uh, paintings. And in his old house, which is, I can't quite, is it near Holborn? Isn't it that way, here, yeah. yeah. Um, he basically rammed it absolutely full of all of his amazing treasures and collections. And so when you walk in there now, it's sort of everything is on display. So you walk into the basement and you look up and there's sort of a sarcophagus in front of you and then oil paintings on the wall and everything's just in there in this sort of mental hodgepodge of um, amazing, amazing artifacts. Why do we why do we frown upon hoarders? in these in these worlds then do you know what i mean right this day and age like think of brian from afterlife mm. you know i'm always looked at as a bit of a fucking weirdo they're like oh god look at this hoarder he's got stacks and stacks of shit in his house this john so fellow you've just described he was just a rich hoarder a rich hoarder and yeah, now you want me to go back to his house <laughs> with a sarcophagus what's he got a dead body for in his house <laughs> is it is it's not oh who's who, who is it I don't know. Oh. I'm afraid. And he's just got... So he's a rich hoarder, and that's a secret museum to go to. This was a long time ago. Oh. So he was around in, uh, I think, the late 1700s. So it's been... His collection's then been on display as a museum for quite a long time. If oh. you were to go to this museum, and it's a free one, Joe, which is a nice touch. Yeah, it's nice. You can then walk across the square to the other side of the square, and there's something called the Hunterian museum which would blow your mind yeah what's that one then sarah yeah another good one um so i think the hunterian is a museum that has lots of human specimens on display it is what like real life ones so it's the museum of the royal college of surgeons so it's got a lot of stuff that will blow your mind in jars what, po proper body parts? proper yeah Oh my God, it's like, uh, I, I mean, it's weird, but it was one of my favourite shows growing up, probably explains a lot of why I have issues now, um, was that German uh, doctor. The fascination guy. Slightly illegal, but he used to do a live one on Channel 4 mm. on on the dead bodies yeah. and how he would then make them into... Body works. Body works. Yeah. And, and fuck, that fascinates the fuck out of me. That is so cool. But the Hunterian, what's it called? Hunterian. Hunterian, yeah. That sounds to me, it would be a little bit too um, Sideshow Bob. No, nope. who's the guy from Silence of the Lambs? Anthony Billy, Hopkins. Billy Dust, no. Billy Bob. <laughs> he likes skin. Oh, yes. What's his name? I know the one you mean. But Buffalo Bill. The, Buffalo Bill. It's too Buffalo Billy. Mm. You know what I mean? When, you, when they open up that garage... And there's like the hearse, yeah. and then there's the head in the jar, the jar Hunterian sort of place. I don't want to put it off because I'm actually fascinated. What time's it open till? <laughs> it's closed until 2023, but it's worth going when it reopens. Are they waiting for bodies? <laughs> to just restock. I think it's a wider project with the building it's ha it's housed in. Oh right, um, that sounds a little bit very much, very much worth a trip. That sounds a bit more. Um, is the De Morgan Museum the only one you've worked in? It's not. Oh. What other ones have you been at? So I've been at the De Morgan now for about five years. And before that, I was at the British Library, then the National Gallery. And then one of my favourite museums, which is Helmshaw Mill Textile Museum um, in Rochdale, just Ooh. near Manchester. And what would we find there? Well, it's, uh, as you can imagine, <laughs> an old mill. Well, no. <laughs> strap yourselves in. <laughs> Here we go. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, it's one of um, the a mill that was part of the cotton industry in Lancashire. So it's an old woolen fulling and cotton spinning mill. So back in the day when Lancashire obviously had hundreds and thousands of mills, yeah. it was just one of many that would take cotton uh, cloth in that had already been recycled. And then they've got all these machines that would shred that up and then it could be spun back into very fine threads uh, that would then be rewoven into more cotton fabric. 
but the oldest part of it from the 17th century had uh, a woolen fulling mill. And this is my favourite thing that you learn in museums like this one, is that during the woolen fulling process, you're making wool cloth. And anyone who's put something uh, wool in the washing machine at too high a temperature will yeah, know that okay. that yeah, shrinks it right down. So to make woolen cloth, you do have to put it into water. And to stop it getting tense and fraught, you put it on tenter hooks, which stretches <gasps> it out. And we used to have a tenter frame with tenter hooks in the museum. So that's where that phrase comes from. <gasps> Look at that. I know, I know it, as in I've heard the word, don't know the context. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm sitting here on tenter hooks. I'm waiting on tenter hooks. Yeah. What does that mean? It means that you're really excited, but you're sort of stretched out and nervous as well. It might be, let's say uh, there was a realistic proposition of you going to the next Rugby World Cup and you were waiting for the phone call from Eddie Jones telling you yes or no. You might be on tenter hooks. Yeah, but you haven't explained to me what tenter hooks means. So it's just literally explained <laughs> what tenter hooks are. What, so you have to hang from a hook <laughs> to f feel like that way. You're, is it nervous or excited? A bit of both, a bit of both. But the phrase comes from um, the process of making woolen fabric when you have to wet it and then to stop it shrinking, you put it across tenter hooks either side of a tenter frame so it keeps its shape and size whilst it's drying. So I'm waiting on tenter hooks. You're on tenter hooks. Why? <laughs> Say it again. Say the exact same words for a third time. <laughs> Hello, I'm Joe Marler. From the Joe Marler Show. We now do socks that you can also wear on your hands, apparently. And the cool thing about these socks are, not only are they jazzy and got my face on them for some ridiculous reason. Uh, stand for socks. Every pair you buy of the Joe Marler Show socks will then donate a pair of warm antibacterial ones to someone who desperately needs them. So go on, go buy some. Not sure why he's thrown a pair at me. If you, if you, if you, if you buy them, they, won't, they will come in the post in a normal way and they won't be thrown at you. Stay classy, where insert the place that you live at now. <laughs> Hit the link below if you want a pair of socks you can then pretend to be a cat and lick yourself. Can we talk security, Sarah? Because we'd all be familiar with films where near the wells have broken into museums yep. to steal priceless objects. I'm thinking of the wrong trousers. The oh, starters. Yeah, yeah. Um, a seminal piece on museum. It, is, a, it yeah. is the seminal piece. Would that be realistic, by the way, getting a penguin in an upside down pair of trousers over the red lasers? I should think if you wanted to do it enough, you could figure out a way. Yeah. Are there red lasers in museums? Sorry, no, I can't let that one go. Um, Sarah's just said that that could be possible. Why not? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's 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 literally impossible. You could not train a penguin to go upside down in a museum and go through all the lasers. Just want that on the record. Okay. Okay. Stop with this nonsense. Being silly. You two. Yeah. It's no ordinary penguin. It's Feathers McGraw. Security. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. What well, do you want to know? Are there red lasers? Is yes. that the question? Yes. Um. I don't think so. Oh. I don't oh. think you can see them. I think the red is maybe just a cinematic. Oh, of course. Oh, so there, there are it. probably. But lasers. there are alarms. But what if I was to get like a vape before I rob, <gasps> rob the place? Yeah. And I take a big drag of it and then I go. <sighs> and then I can see him, can't I? I don't know. I've never tried that. Uh -huh. I'll try it and. So with that one, you're happy. You're <laughs> happy to disagree that that's probably not going to happen. But but the penguin but thing. The penguin's fine. Hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Cool. Thank yeah. you, Sarah. I can see where this is going. <laughs> that's absolutely cool. Does stuff get nicked for museums or not? It does, unfortunately. <gasps> yeah. Yeah. So despite best efforts of museums to protect the collections that are in them and the public that come to visit, obviously there are always going to be people who are one step ahead um, and people who want to take things. From museums These that's are... that's bonkers though who are you flogging it to exactly my thought joe you go right i'm going to nick this uh, faberge egg uh, probably from the 16th uh, century and it's actually the one with the mini blue uh, dove mm. on it with the and <laughs> i've got that and then i go all right uh dave you want to buy three it? bells in a friday six bells six bells I was uh, that wrong. usually a saturday um 
want to buy this egg? And they go, oh, let's have a look at that then. And then he's got, and he goes, oh, what do you want for it? I said, 100 quid. I said, there you go, have you 100 quid? They go, yeah, fine, and it pays for the night. What the fuck's he doing with that egg? Like, someone's going to know, you can't nick shit without it getting found out, surely. What's the point in it? Unless you keep it for yourself and you're one of the Stobart, what's his name? <laughs> Edward Stobart? De Morgan. No, 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 the, the John hoarder. Stone. John Stone. 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 John Stone. Yeah. Hoarder. Yeah. Surely you'd get caught. Well, there are obviously loads of systems in place in museums to make sure that they're secure. So we've got the same style security that you might expect on a domestic building where windows will be alarmed, doors will be alarmed. There's quite a lot of things that are in place as well next time we go to a big museum to notice is that lots of galleries often don't have windows. They'll have sort of fixed skylights instead to prevent people coming in through the windows. Lots of museums will have either overnight security or an alarm centre that um, will be called to d- immediately get the police to the museum should anything be, any the alarms be broken during the night. Uh, and then, of course, you've got guards in lots of museums you'll go to. You see them walking around, keeping an eye on everything. So there are lots of measures that are in place to make sure that things aren't stolen. But I think when they are, um, it's quite often, you've got to think who might be stealing these things. And I don't think it's someone just sort of trying to get lucky and take something off the wall. Quite often it's organised crime um, that will nick things to order. So one uh, to look up, if uh, if anyone's sort of very interested, is at Dulwich Picture Gallery um, a couple of years ago now. There was an exhibition of paintings by a Dutch artist called Rembrandt. Um, very muddy looking One of my favourites, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rembrandt with a T. Rembrandt, yeah. yep. Yeah. That's him. Um, and so these pictures were actually stolen from... Um, the gallery despite best efforts of the museum that have been put in place to protect them but they only got as far as just immediately outside when they were caught by the police and those objects were taken back so do we think so when you say that had been stolen to order i would some, imagine so i don't know shady multi-millionaire in their massive mansion somewhere has thought i fancy a rembrandt of my own they've contacted someone and they've said that's the rembrandt i want bring it to me yeah have you seen mr bean <laughs> Which one? The first one, the film, mm. not the series. The first Mr. Bean film. When he's um That's not the one in France, that's number two, is it? I think that's Mr. Bean goes on goes on holiday. Yeah. That's when he loses the kid. Yes. Or he doesn't lose him, he kidnaps yeah. him. So he, and actually uh, talking of that one, you know when he's doing some busking, mm-hmm. remember that one in the in the market and he puts and he does the miming to that opera song? Did you cry? No. So I cried at that. <laughs> it was fucking unbelievable. Powerful, moving. One of my favourite movie scenes ever. But back to the first one, <laughs> when it was something to do with the museum, he fucks up this painting, doesn't he? I think it's Whistler's mum or... That's exactly right. Is yeah. it Whistler's mum? Yeah. Yeah. He fucks it up and he's like, oh no, and he tries, oh my God, and then he tries rubbing it off and he uses white spirit or something and it f- completely fucks it. So then he goes, right, how am I going to do this? He cuts it all off, cuts it out, I mean, and then paints an exact replica of it and he puts it up and uh, uh, by the end of it, I don't want to ruin the, the plot for you or uh, anyone who's listening who who wants to look at Mr. Bean 1, <laughs> um, but I'm going to. So if you don't want it spoiled, just turn it off for about 30 seconds. <laughs> Beep. No one notices. It's completely fucking immaculate. He's wonderful. What an artist. Incredible. Don't know it. Beep. That's the <laughs> end of the plot. Which leads me on to my question about security. Is the Mona Lisa real? Yes. How do you know that someone hasn't just copied that, especially this day and age with the technology that not just the Mona Lisa, but any famous painting like the Screaming Woman, what's it called? The Scream. The Scream. Or um, the Picasso with the red, blue and yellow blocks. Is that Picasso? The Weeping Woman. No, no, no. There was this other one. He had a lot of blocks. Probably Picasso. Oh, okay. There we go. We'll go with the Weeping Woman. How do we know they're all real? How do we know they're not replicas or fakes to protect the real ones? And actually, the Mona Lisa is hidden in a cave in Germany. 
Do you know, when I worked at the National Gallery for a while, I worked in visitor services, so answering questions from the public. And where do you keep the real ones was the number was one it? most asked question after where are the toilets? <laughs> Definitely. Um, I think people find it quite astonishing to sort of learn that these things are three, four hundred years old and they still look so new, so fresh. And the fact that they have been preserved for all this time. But when things come into museums collection someone like a curator um, so someone like myself usually will do a full provenance check on the objects that means that they have to work out exactly where it's from which bona fide sales it's been through to get to where it is and you, you have to trace it all the way almost directly back to the artist who painted it and if we're talking about paintings um, to make sure that what enters the collection is absolutely what someone is claiming for it to be Following on from that, there's a team of curators and conservators who actually, you know, touch up the pictures or, or get them looking their best for display. And it never really will go out of anybody's sight. There's always someone and a, a paper trail behind it when objects get moved around museums, um, even if that's just from one space on the wall to the space next to it, to show that that's happened. When you were handling those unbelievably expensive and culturally important items, Sarah, did you ever shit yourself? <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a scary thing to do to to get hold of something and to, you know, check its condition, say, or to move it across galleries. But quite often you won't do that on your own, especially, you know, we've had the tiles today that they're, they're, you'd obviously only need one person for that. But to move an enormous artwork, then obviously you'd need a team of people to do that for you. Joe, if you were to attempt to steal something, because let's say, what's your favourite painting? What would you steal? Uh, my favourite painting, mm. probably the one of Cozy in my kitchen. Okay, I'm thinking maybe one in a museum. Oh, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, the Louvre. I went to the Louvre, Louvre, with the uh, with the paintings, and I quite liked this one of uh, Napoleon. Okay, this fucking giant one. Obviously, he's not. He wasn't giant, but he was like. Massive. How big? Like, pff, big. <laughs> yeah. Like snooker table big or? Oh yeah, as big as that. It was fucking ginormous. They've got like, some big stuff. Oh there, my god, they? yeah, one of them. Or oh, what's that battle one? There's like these horses like over there, and then there's like other horses at that one. We'll go with that one, the Battle of Hastings. If you wanted to steal it, <clears throat> mm -hmm. how would you go about it? I'll give you a couple of options, but you're free to choose your own options. Yep. You could get through the lasers, which may or may not be red. Yeah. Like Catherine Zeta-Jones. I think they were green. Okay, green yeah. ones. Um, you can do an inside job where either you get a job in the Louvre or you mm -hmm. pay off someone. Mm -hmm. um, or you can do something creative like in a Thomas Crown affair when uh, Pierce Brosnan gets loads of people to dress exactly the same as him in like a little bowler hat, doesn't he? And I haven't seen that, but that sounds fucking it's incredible. Like, it's not spoil that one for you. Which You've option? got to give spoiler warnings, mate. Which option are you choosing? Uh, I quite like the thought of bowling about in a like hat. And did he have an umbrella? I think so. I'm just thinking of that sort of like <laughs> Sarah's like, why the fuck are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Crown affair. You having a laugh? Um, I'd probably do. I'd go in. You know the the pyramid, the glass one above ground, in the courtyard at the that loop. goes down, which is scaled apparently exactly to the same pyramid underneath it is that right yep like it's to scale which is fucking bonkers i love the thought of that i i actually the more we've spoken about museums the more i i fucking love learning shit about the past even if there is a cynical side to me that goes oh i don't believe it but i think it's important to have a little bit of that I just love it. Even you talking about the cotton and that sort of thing. I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. This is like what they see. I just want to go to all the fucking museums of the world now. I would cut a hole in one of those pyramid glasses. Glass pyramid. One of those little devices. Yeah, so it goes... And you've got some suckers on the glass. It doesn't fall. that there days hold that <laughs> she's holding that for me she's like oh fucking hurry up mate sweat my fucking tits off here <laughs> yeah alright yeah, yeah. and then I'd look at it and I'd go oh fuck it's too small to get through yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> it rolled that Jasper <laughs> about to bring the family along yeah, yeah we've got no babysitter if you bought Jasper why yeah. not just send him through the original hole fuck hang on pass that here Dace you here Dace you bring that no nails <laughs> Jasper, come here. All right, mate. <laughs> Fuck him off down there. He's got a rope. And then it, I'd uh, I'd say to Maggie, Maggie, hit the music. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, what's the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's, what's the Mission Impossible music? <laughs> you can't do it now. You've done the other I'm one. The it, goes, it goes... Um... It's very similar, yeah. but different. <laughs> 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 I had it in my head about Gonna it. need it for the joke. Yeah, and then what I do? Maggie, hit it. She's like, okay. Dum 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 Jasper, Jasper, wait, wait, wait. And then I'd stop him just before the ground. So he hovers. And then I'd say, Felix, and because he's at the cab. Felix, get that vape. <laughs> So then he takes a massive drag and then he's down the Just hole. Remind me how old Felix is now. He's three. But, and okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he fucks all this vape smoke down there so Jasper can see all the lasers. Jasper's, uh, he's a black belt in Taekwondo and Capoeira. Um, so he's dancing all around that lot. And Perfect. Goes over to the uh, Mona Lisa. Am I nicking that one? Up to you. Yep, do what we want. We go to the Mona Lisa. We go to the... It's the fucking world's smallest picture as well, isn't Not it? Not big. I was... Yeah. I, I couldn't, uh, as a kid, you you know all about this Mona Lisa picture. You see it everywhere. You're taught, like, this is who, who, who painted it? Da Vinci. You're taught Da Vinci painted it and... Okay. But then... So you just presume it's this giant picture. Were you disappointed? I was disappointed. I think it's a letdown, isn't it, when you get there? Well, mainly because you can't fucking get to the front. No. It's, like thousands of people in the room, all with their phones up, and you go, mm. should have just Googled that. Would have been, <laughs> it's not quite the same. I was hoping it'd be empty and yeah. you just sit on that, that little uh, seat By in front yourself. of it and you look at it and you go, huh, is that a man or a woman? And then you go through the story and you go, did he mean to paint it so masculine? Or actually, is it how the eye of the beholder? Anyway, Felix, he's got that out and he's nicked it in there. Then I've chucked down the uh, glass cutter. Mm -hmm. He's then cut out the thing. It is behind 12 inches of bulletproof glass. What? So you might need some different equipment. It's right. Like valuable information. That yeah, is that really is, important. Yeah, yeah. Dace, chuck us a gun. <laughs> oh, fuck, you said it's bulletproof. <laughs> Here, Dace. I mean, there's our pixies with us as well. Pixie, chuck us that RPG, will you? So then I fuck up to this why RPG it, down to Jasper. Get, why don't you get it to pass your screwdriver and just unscrew it where it's screwed, the glass is screwed in? It's not screwed in. It's uh, sealed within the box. So he's then shot this Mona Lisa up. Security are here by this time as well. No, because the we the night before put on a Did big uh, dinner yeah. of which we poisoned their food. Fine. So that, that part of Paris, dead. Dead. And th so he's shot it. He's op broken the glass that he said was unbreakable, unbreakable, impenetrable, like that word, and um, picks it off the wall. And then he looks at it, and it's a fake because Ryan Atkinson had been there about an hour <laughs> oh, before, replaced it. it, and uh, then, the, then the other police turned up got him they they arrest him they shop here eh, jasper jasper you are under arrest for the, uh, killing all of the officers yesterday and now you blow up uh, the the glass and <laughs> we then leave and we go paris has him now he's the eldest so save some money on that eurostar getting home now yeah. though 
So although nice. I'm sorry it was a little bit uh, long-winded, but we've been planning it for a while, and I just wanted to let you know. It's all pushed back. I don't think your mic's working. Can you speak into it? Yes. Why did it go off? It did go off, didn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it did go. Spooky. It like ghosts. Like ghosts at night, you know? That's when they mm. come out. Mm. Have you ever worked in a museum at night? Oh, no. Well, on a technicality, yes. Because I used to work in a school just after I finished university before mm. I started in museums. And I had to take, like, 30 children for a sleepover at the Science Museum. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I was... <laughs> Imagine that. Not one that of your favourite things work. to do then. Yeah, what well, time did they fall some asleep? Some people, well, they didn't. No. That was. That oh, was, no. Uh, yeah, and therefore neither did I. So, who came up with that concept? Let's have a sleepover at a museum. Why, what's the point in that? Why didn't. There's no beds. Yeah, we all took our sleeping bags. I think they still do it now. It was oh. a couple of years ago, but yeah. Again, these different ways of engaging audiences and bringing people in and let's have a sleepover at the Science Museum. So, yes, I have been in a museum overnight. I think that would be quite... Let's say you were at the Natural History Museum, Jack. Mm. She flagged up already. Mm. Would you be having uh, a night at the museum thoughts in your head? I think my overriding thought would be... <sighs> what came first? Oh. The museum or the whale? That's what I'd be thinking. I'd go, how the fuck have they fitted that whale through that door? Yeah. Or was the whale here? and they Living went, whale? Yeah, and it, it, was, um, it was beached. And they went, we should build a museum around that. <laughs> oh, are you asking? Yeah, sorry, I'm asking oh. the museum expert, actually. <laughs> did they, is that what they did? Uh, no, so the museum was there before the whale okay. went into it. Okay, but yeah. I look at all the doorways and I'm like, How, they haven't fitted that whale through those doors. There's no doors big, big enough for that to fit. So they made it in there, did they? Yeah, so the whale is obviously fossilised bones and was there to replace Dippy the dinosaur, if you ever went oh, when mm. Dippy the dinosaur. Hasn't Dippy come back, though? Dippy's back Dippy's now. back. Where did Dippy go? Dippy went on a little tour of lots of museums around the country. So if you, for example, live in Dorset and you can't get up to London, then Dippy came to you. What do we know about Dorset? Uh, cliffs? No, it's also known as the... Jurassic Coast. And why? Because they filmed Jurassic Park there. No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> yes, that was just one of the many museums that Dippy went on tour to. But, um, yeah, obviously these two fossilised skeletons are enormous and they were constructed in the room. Um, but to do something like take Dippy on tour, take it down and rebuild it, Obviously, it's a lot of bones that all fit together on um, a sort of a, a mount or a structure. If next time you go, you'll look at it. You can see that piece of equipment there holding all of that together so we can stand under it and look at it. Um, but each individual piece of the dinosaur skeleton or of the whale skeleton will be registered on systems. It will have reports that go against it so that we can look at the condition of it. We can check that nothing changes between the different venues so that we're always preserving that history. Um, and yeah, lots of photographs. It's like putting in a giant jigsaw puzzle back together. I just had a thought as well, Sarah. Dangerous. If, if Dippy's going around the country, like, I am one of the worst rappers of birthday presents in humanity. I honestly oh. thought you were just going to stop at rappers. Yeah, I did for a minute there. <laughs> Sarah, where is it? I was ready. Rappers, what the fuck's My flow's actually quite good. <laughs> but <laughs> if you were sending Dippy around the country, you can't just whack him in some newspaper and use a bit of sellotape as I would. You can't do that for a birthday present. Wow. Well. <laughs> Maybe a bit of magazine. How are you? Uh, uh, but how, seriously, how are you moving him? You're surely a shitload of bubble wrap. Not bubble wrap um, for museum objects. It's not brilliant because you know the tiny little bubbles. They've got pockets of gas in them, and that can off gas and affect um, the object. So that's not a great packing material for museum objects. You would use an acid-free tissue paper, Ooh. and then each piece would go into something more robust. So either a cardboard carton or. Um, Often they're foam lined and then all of those pieces go into wooden crates usually and then they can get either driven on a specialised vehicle um, that's for art transport or if it was going internationally then they would get palletised, put on an aeroplane and flown to the other side of the world. It's pretty impressive that, isn't it? It's it super impressive. so much care over that. I'd actually like to do that. Would you? I'd like to be a... a packer. An artefact packer. Because that would be so much fun. Quite a lot of stationery involved as well, isn't there? You know, 
got to label that bit, yeah. got to wrap that bit. You do get to use a tape dispenser. They're always fun, aren't oh, they? Superb. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah. yeah. Getting good at that, am I? Cheers, boy. Um, so I recently bought uh, my daughter a metal detector. Great. You know the ones that you see down the beach and that lot. She wants she she wants to go metal detecting. She says for her daddy day out. I'm like cool, brilliant. Sounds like great crack. And Which, do you have one as well, or will you just be watching her do it? No, oh, I just use hers. I couldn't afford yeah. both, mate. It's fine. Kind of, yeah. And then, uh, but I also bought her a magnet as well, like a fucking giant magnet for fishing. You heard of magnet fishing before? No. What? Okay, so you know fishing. Yeah. <laughs> For fish. For fish. Yeah. So imagine that, but without the rod. Yeah. So it's just a rope. And on the end of that rope is a magnet about that big, size of my fist. A side, side plate. No, what? What side plate? Why is your fist? You've, you've just changed the shape. Yeah, as no. described it. Size of a side plate. And that picks it like it's really strong. It's like, yeah. Got you. So you do magnet fishing, hence yep. the thing. She wants to do that. So do that. So say me and Maggie are doing that down in Eastbourne and we discover a Neolithical brass arrowhead. You know. Yeah, you might. Yeah, I might. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. And I go, oh, wow, this is incredible. I want to get a bit more information on it. I get it uh, confirmed that it's Neolithical from that area is this and, you know, what do you want to do about it, mate? And I go, well, I want to present it to the museum the natural history or british museum what museum would i go to for that one? probably the british museum for british museum Arrowhead. okay yep. are you buying that off me <laughs> so if you're the british museum will you pay me to donate that or is it a donation <laughs> So there's actually uh, another piece of legislation in place in this country called the Treasure Act. And that actually means that you are not going to be able to be entitled to any money from that in total. So depending on how much it's worth, you and the landowner will have to share that because... Who owns the beach? Who owns the beach? You'd have to find that out. Does the Queen own the beach? Why don't you just say you found it in your back garden? Because then you own it. All right. Double your money. I found it in my garden. No, I don't mean to Sarah. Oh. I mean to, <laughs> <laughs> to the museum. Sarah already knows what already that, knows we've actually found out on the beach. Yeah. She's listening. <laughs> <laughs> so that treasure act. Yeah. So the, you, the British Museum. And if it's deemed important enough, it means that it automatically has to go to um, one of the museums. Uh, what do you mean deemed important enough? Like, I'm offering you my Neolithic arrowhead. Yeah. You're not offering me anything in return. <laughs> <laughs> so how's that work as as, as a trade off? Like, just gear something. Offer me. What about a so year? If it was worth something, then, like I say, you and the landowner would have to share the money. Okay, I'm both. So you actually pay me for it. If the museum wanted to acquire it, brilliant. That's that's the key. That's why I said <clears throat> if it was important enough. Okay, so it is fucking important. You're paying me because I'm the landowner and the discoverer. But. Yeah. I also want a, fa a, f a family pass <laughs> for life free here. You'd have to negotiate that. See if you could get that into I the am. of the... I am negotiating yeah. that now. I don't, I don't work at the British Museum. Okay, so. all right. The De Morgan. <laughs> Can I have a family pass to the De Morgan? You, yes. Oh. <gasps> Do, do you need to pay anyway to go to the De Morgan? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nor the British Museum, in fairness. So. What? Are you not? <laughs> no, it's all free. Fuck, there what museums have I been that going that I have to pay? I'm sure going to the Natural History Museum costs me an arm and a leg. Yeah. In the shop. I think it's oh, That's probably where they the get shop, you. Yeah. Probably the rail prices like four, as well. Four quid for a slice of cake, isn't oh, it? Oh, motherfuckers. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Gosh, <laughs> My mate Mickey Love, Sarah... Um, Say that again. My mate Mickey Love. His name's Mickey Love. Mickey Love, yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah I was just unsure. Bear in mind, Sarah's brought a partner with. Yeah. I thought you were saying, Sarah, my mate Mickey Love. <laughs> and you were Is his surname him. Love? No, it's a nickname oh, more than Mickey anything Love. else. Yeah. Okay. So just kind of like, you didn't just refer to Sarah as Love at no. the end of your sentence. Oh, poor. So my mate Mickey Love. Yes. Sarah. He 
as soon as Banksy started to appear on the scene, very early doors, he declared himself a fan of Banksy's work. And he got, and we're going back to sort of late 90s, he got a one of a very small limited number of Banksy bits of artwork. And over the course of about two years, the value of this thing, which he'd just got because he liked Banksy at that point, rocketed in value to the point where it was basically in a tube in his attic and it very quickly became worth more than his house. <gasps> and then he had the problem of he couldn't afford to insure it. So how do you insure all the stuff in a massive museum? Well, um, well, again, <laughs> can't stop doing it now. Is, is That's something I've just inherited today. Is there a is there a museum of Wales? There should be probably. Yeah, I think you should be I the curator, director there, director instead. of yeah. the Museum of Wales. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. 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 <laughs> yeah. All the major museum, all the national museums and galleries in England and Wales, um, do not insure any of their collections. None of them. What? So if you went into the National Gallery and you looked upon the Leonardo da Vinci we were talking about earlier, then that isn't insured for any financial compensation to the gallery should anything happen to it. Why? Because it's already been bought once by the government and as a taxpayer, I'm sure you'd agree that a good spend of your money from the government isn't to pay an insurance premium to cover something that is astronomically expensive to insure that also could never be replaced should anything happen to it. Makes sense. The replacement value does make That's sense. It. So instead, the How money the fuck goes are you replacing to... that anyway? So well, you're not. Exactly, yeah. you're not. They're all one-offs. So instead, the it? money goes towards making sure things like our security is, you know, impenetrable uh, from <laughs> people with their children and glass cutters and to make sure that we've got um, the correct environmental conditions in a gallery. So they're quite specific at what temperature and what humidity you can have in the gallery so that no damage should occur to it. But sometimes um, people do cause damage to artworks. And I don't know if you've seen recently on the news the people um, from different climate activist groups who've been gluing themselves to artworks, um, not just in this country, but in Italy as well. Uh, and so obviously that, you know, that does cause damage, but quite often that will be dealt with in-house. Um, and there's sort of brilliant in-house teams of conservators that respond to this sort of thing. Do you think aliens helped Egyptians build the pyramids? Um, personally, uh, no. I don't know. Sarah, I agree with you. But this has been a, a theme of today's chat with me and Joan. Okay, and just on that last one, where could I, where, where would I go to find out the most about Egyptians? Which museum? In this country. In this country, yeah. Yeah, probably the British Museum. British They've got Museum. Amazing big galleries of. Um, and that's free, property. is it? It is, yeah. It's free. You don't have to pay for that. Much. Yeah, like, that's important. British Museum. There's also the Petrie Museum of Egyptology, which is part of University College London. Pe oh, that sounds like a, I like quite a niche one. Is it a Petrie? P E T R I. Some bloke surname. Oh, I spelled it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> How many consonants and vowels are in this word that you're trying to spell? It's not fucking countdown, mate. <laughs> Don't come at me like that. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> Have you got anything else you would like to say, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> Visit museums, that's what I want to say. And I am going to be a massive advocate for that. Are you, Tom? Joe, I'm with you because even as we've been talking, having said that I don't really go to museums, that's not true. I've just remembered the last time I went to Liverpool, I went to the Beatles Museum, which was amazing. And then like, in what, the Albert did, Dock, Like dung? Yeah, all sorts of Beatles in there. And then... <laughs> Next to it is a, is a museum about slavery because obviously slavery was a really yeah. important part of Liverpool's past. And both of them were mind-blowing. Totally different subjects, but mind-blowing. So, Joe, I'm in agreement. More museums. Yeah, I think we should go to museums more. Let's do it. Okay. Let's find out or at least open up our minds a bit more mm. on what happened in the past to then help us shape our future. It's almost like I've... You're so pleased with that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> I don't know where I've got that from, but I nicked it. That's quite Jerry Spring. Sarah, thank you so much. Honestly, this one, I say I do say it a lot, but thank you, especially to you for coming on and putting up with this. <laughs>
fucking nonsense. I love it. I love it. Because nonsense. we've really enjoyed having you on and talking all things museums. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Sarah.